Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Uh, I'm Father Tony Sylvia, and joining me, as always, is Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. And today we're going to be talking about the dark side of Christmas, woo, for our spooky Christmas special, which is going to be a lot of fun. And to help us do that, we have Benito Serino of the Comics Alliance. Hello, Benito, and thanks for joining us. Hey, how are you guys doing? Great, great. So, you know, just, uh, you know, open right up with, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do and, and your comics and, and, you know, stuff like that, all the things you like. <laughs> Well, that's a lot of things, but sure. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a writer uh, for and about comics. I've written comics uh, such as Tales from the Bully Pulpit, Hector Plasm, I wrote The Tick for a while. Uh, currently writing a web comic called The Mummy Sabbatical. Uh, I also write about comics for uh, the website comicsalliance.com, where uh, I write about comics history, comics trivia, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also, uh, I also run a Tumblr blog where I answer questions about uh, classical mythology, uh, hagiography, uh, Latin language stuff, um, or uh, very frequently uh, Christmas lore. Mm. <laughs> exactly our kind of nerdery. Too <laughs> <laughs> far up our alley. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Christmas, um, you know, it's the happiest time of the year. It's, uh, you know, kids jingle belling and whatnot. And, uh, but not always, right? That's a relatively recent innovation in Christmas, isn't it? Sure. Uh, yeah, basically since the advent of electrical light, pretty much. Uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, I do get the question frequently. In fact, I think I have a question in my Tumblr ask box right now from someone asking about that line in the most wonderful time of the year. Why, why do you tell scary ghost stories? Mm. And, uh, and the answer to that is because... Uh, Christmas is dark and it's cold, and before we had indoor heating and electrical lights, probably you would die. And, <laughs> and so, Just probably, uh, yeah, it's greater yep. than average statistically, uh, you probably die. Uh, and so, yeah, for that reason, for you know, hundreds of years, uh, Christmas was a time much like Halloween that was considered uh, to be. Uh, a time when the border between our, this world and the next is is, is thinner, um, and so you have all sorts of uh, scary stuff out. Fairies are, would be out at this time, which is werewolves, especially, are associated with Christmas. Uh, Goblins, trolls, uh, that kind of stuff. Sometimes you get more where that's a result of witches, for example, being angry about the holy se season of Christmas, and so they would be out causing trouble. Um, sometimes, with the case of werewolves, uh, the idea is that, for some reason, I guess, uh, Jesus would get jealous, uh, and so if you're born during the 12 days of Christmas, you're uh, cursed to be a werewolf, because um, you're trying to show up Jesus on his birthday. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a long history of all sorts of um, darker stuff in the Christmas season, and it's, yeah, and it's really only in the Victorian era when, um, lighting first, you know, gas light, and then later electrical light, um, that we start to be able to relax a little bit at the, at the Christmas season. Is the, uh, is, does it also have to do with the solstice? Because that's, that's the longest night of the year, right? And it's right before oh, Christmas? Oh, oh for yeah. sure. And, um, yeah, especially in uh, Scandinavian countries where it's particularly dark um, for a longer period of time, um, uh, they really celebrate their one of their big um, celebrations is St. Lucy's Day on December 13th, which uh, on the older calendar would have been uh, the longest night of the year. And so they they definitely focus on the light of St. Lucy there. And so candles and the candle uh, wreath crown are a big part of the celebration uh, there, having to do with trying to provide light during the darkest time. Right. So, uh, so we have. Uh, I forgot to put in questions about werewolves, but Christmas is particularly a werewolf holiday. So we got werewolves. I know witches, what the thumbnail for this video ghosts. is going to be. Oh, he's, oh okay. <laughs> um, it's it's a lot of the traditions uh, that we associate with Halloween originally tagged to Christmas. Were, were they were they all like Christmas um, uh, traditions, and did we move them to Halloween, or they were on both uh, holidays, like when, when it came time to sort of sanitize Christmas and make it a little bit cheerier? Uh, I, I, a lot of those, um, 
a lot of them are kind of from both. I'm not sure. It's, it's, they're both similar, originally kind of holidays. And so the things like um, going door to door, um, demanding treats, that uh, is still, uh, still a tradition in some areas for Christmas. I mean, it's not, we still have caroling, which is a similar kind of thing, but, you know, would have been wassailing at first, or you would have had, um, uh, in the 1900s, you have the uh, Calathumpian bands, where uh, street bands of people who are not particularly good at music would go and play terrible music until uh, you gave them something to go away. Uh, and sometimes they would even, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes they would even come into your house and just start playing music, and if, or and you'd have to give them food until they left. But um, even costumes, um, wearing costumes to go door to door demanding uh, treats. Uh, that's a tradition uh, with, uh, with Christmas in some places. For example, um, again, Scandinavia, the Yule goat, um, which now is just a tradition, uh, more or less of a giant uh, straw goat that gets burnt down every year. Uh, yeah. But it used to it be lasted a person- one day this year, right? Not even, not even a whole day. Yes, a couple, a few hours uh, before the uh, the Gebli goat got burnt down. Uh, there's another one in Iceland that I think maybe didn't hasn't burnt yet. I don't know. I have, I haven't checked in on that one. But the original Yule goat tradition was one uh, similar to um, similar to English uh, mumming practices, and similar to in Wales they do uh, the Mari Luid uh, tradition with with this skeletal horse. Uh, goes around uh, caroling and demanding treats, but also, uh, you'd, so the Yule goat would have originally been a person in a, a goat or a goat-like costume, a mask and everything, surrounded by um, characters similar to, like, Mummer's stock characters or Commedia dell'arte style characters. You know, you might have Punch and Judy with them or whatever, and they would go around and, uh, yeah, similar to those bands, they would come in and they might do a little play or they might do a song or basically they'd come in and annoy you until uh, you got, until you gave them some food and they left. Um, and so traditions like that of, uh, of guising, uh, putting on disguise and going door to door, those go way back. Some of those go as far back as Saturnalia, even that, that would be a, a tradition. Yeah. I'll, um, when we post this too, we will, you know, we'll put in show notes, of course, and we'll put it on our Facebook. And uh, I'll definitely have to put in some. There's some vintage footage I found of, of the Mary Lud from uh, from Wales, and it's basically, particularly for a child, it's basically pants crappingly terrifying. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's made from from the skeleton of a horse, and there's like a person with with a sheet underneath, and it goes door to door, like snapping at you, and like yeah. there's got to be just generations of of Welsh children with uh. Uh, with just many, many disorders. Um, sure. Father, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take the, uh, the next question because I know every internet nerd who is watching or listening to this uh, who has an interest about the dark side and Christmas is wondering about a particular figure. Oh, uh, maybe you mean Krampus? I do indeed. <laughs> yeah, so um, Krampus is, is hot right now, huh? Uh, yeah, pretty hot. So for the three people who might exist in the world who don't know who Krampus is, why don't you give us a quick uh, quick rundown of that? Uh, sure. Um, the Krampus or uh, the Krampus or the Krampus uh, is uh, one of a number of dark companions of St. Nicholas. Um, common uh, in Europe, especially in the Alpine regions, there are dozens of variations. The Krampus is just the one that's become the most popular, but, but um, there's... Uh, you've got the Klaubauf, you've got uh, Pelzebach, Bartle, uh, Belzebul, Hans Trap, Hans Muff, uh, and then dozens of similar figure, figures, including um, the Perkson, the train of the goddess Perkta, and they do a similar kind of thing where they do a parade through the street and they're in scary costumes. And, um, and so you know, the idea is that uh, the Krampus is one of, he comes with St. Nicholas on St. Nicholas Day, or St. Nicholas Eve, rather, December 5th. And uh, his job is to uh, punish the naughty children where St. Nicholas gives uh, rewards. And so he's a uh, goat-like uh, demon person, similar to a satyr in a lot of ways, um, usually wearing chains, uh, bells, carrying a bundle of switches, a basket on his back. Uh, and the idea is that particularly naughty children get thrown into the basket and they're either from there dragged to hell or thrown into the river or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, and then uh, throughout Alpine regions, Austria, 
Um, especially they do uh, Krampus runs on December 5th where they have a whole parade of just people in various Krampus costumes. They come through and they, uh, you know, ring bells or spin fire or whatever um, to the delight or the terror of children depending on uh, what kind of child is looking on I guess. Parenting was way easier back then, huh? <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh... Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please. Uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. So yeah, what do, to what do you attribute the uh, resurgence of, of Krampus? Do you think it's just, you know, people are into spooky stuff generally, and this is kind of a subversion of the, you know, 1950s Christmas uh, Bing, Bing Crosby kind of thing? Or I, Yeah, I think it is uh, definitely the latter, where people are reacting to something that feels uh, subversive towards Christmas, which to me is ironic since it's a tradition that goes back hundreds of years, so trying to be subversive to tradition. Everything uh, with, old is new again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I think there's I think there's kind of a post or post postmodern irony or something to it where it's like if you're you know overwhelmed by or uninterested in the commercialism of traditional mainstream Christmas, now you suddenly have this kind of like darker alternative. And uh, I think that's part of the appeal for a lot of people is they, they see some of the saccharine sweet style merchandising and uh, marketing for, you know, you see your Santa Claus and your reindeers and all these things that are for kids and they want something that feels darker, feels more mature, that, yeah, feels subversive. It feels like they're getting away with something, you know, that's part of the appeal for some people. Uh, I hear the movie years, was fantastic. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, everybody who I know that enjoys horror movies thought that Krampus was the best uh, horror movie of last year, so... Oh uh, yeah, that um, that movie uh, is really good from a from a movie standpoint. Like it's a really good kind of dark comedy um, horror. The cast is really good. Tony Collette, Adam Scott, they're really good. From the perspective of being true to real Krampus lore, it's pretty bad. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a good looking, fast paced, fun movie to watch. Probably a surprising number of Krampus movies. Um, the other like. No, really notable one from last year is an anthology film called uh, A Christmas Horror Story that's actually that just went up on Netflix or at least American Netflix. I don't know at other places. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's 
uh, it's pretty good and uh, does have uh, it's an anthology, um, but it does have a, a, a Krampus storyline in it, and so that one's pretty good. But I've also recently discovered a whole batch of really terrible, uh, low-budget Krampus movies that I first saw on the rack for like $4 at Walmart, and some of them I found on Amazon Prime. I started watching this one called uh, Krampus the Reckoning. It is <laughs> real bad. It is, it is real bad. It's uh, about this uh, little watch the end so they're going to reveal something because i know they've shown enough that the little girl is not actually as young as she seems but she's got a little uh like compass doll it's basically like a voodoo doll and she can pull the shackles off of them and then someone will be killed by this awfully rendered uh, <laughs> it's and the acting is really bad the everything about it is terrible uh definitely watch it it's awful. <laughs> So, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, you wrote a, an article for Comics Alliance to talk about how Krampus is, is a misunderstood figure uh, by his, his recent uh, embracement uh, in pop culture, that he's, he's understood or misunderstood as the dark side of St. Nicholas. Could you, could you explain that, that misconception and how he actually represents a, a central metaphor for Christmas? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I've even recently gone out, gone as far to say that... Uh, Krampus has to be good, or else love has failed and Christmas is meaningless. <laughs> uh, and I, it's a strong I mostly, statement. I mostly mean that. Uh, I do mostly mean that sincerely. Um, yeah, the, the thing uh, is that in a lot of modern popular conceptions of Krampus is that he's, uh, he's the dark uh, opponent of Santa Claus. That, like there's some kind of Manichaean duality between the good Santa and an evil Krampus death, right? But that's not the case at all. They're not battling against each other. It's not the Santa has to stop the Krampus or else he's going to ruin Christmas. I, I see that. That's that's the plot of a lot of Krampus material, right? Um, even even uh, Graham Morrison and Dan Moore's excellent Klaus miniseries from this past year that gives the origin of Santa, it ends with Santa having a giant battle against Krampus and he, uh, he fights him uh, in space and then he, on, he catches him on fire, whatever. But like he, that, that one was particularly surprising to me with some of the similarities to themes from All Star Superman that Grant Morrison uh, would not realize that Krampus has to be a tale of redemption, because uh, you know at the center of the Christmas season, uh, and not just Christmas, but uh, you know Saturnalia, Yule, even literally the the winter solstice from an astronomical point of view. Like literally, the point of Christmas is that. Everything is as dark as it's going to get, but now the sun is coming back. The light is coming back, right? And so Christmas has to be about hope for tomorrow, hope for a better future. Something better is coming. That's the, that's the, that's the Christian thing, right? The new the Messiah is here now. Uh, a thrill of hope, the weary soul rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious moment, right? That's, you've got that, but, you know, again, even from an astronomical point of view, tomorrow is going to be a little less darker, a little less dark than it was today. And uh, so it's got to be about things in the future getting better. And so you look at Krampus. First of all, you know he's not the enemy of St. Nicholas because they're always together. They, they hang out. They show up in the same sleigh. They ride the same horse or the same jalopy, depending on what decade your postcards are from. But um, uh, St. Nicholas is not going to hang out with uh, someone who is, is evil. The chains that he wears represent the fact that he has been... Uh, he's been captured. He's he's doing penance for any past crimes he might have done, uh, which presumably were actually harming children. But now, uh, you know, you you can see that in, with Krampus. You can see that with, uh, for example, the the French analog would be Père Fouettard, who is the the whipping father. Uh, he specifically has the origin that he is from the fam probably the most famous uh, Saint Nicholas miracle, the story of the three boys. Um, he's the butcher who, who kills the three young men and puts them in the pickle barrel, and St. Nicholas resurrects them. Um, and as a result, to do penance for that, he becomes St. Nicholas's assistant and has to go and help delight children. And to me, that's got to be the story of Krampus and the Klaubau from Parafutard and Hans Trapp and all these guys. They've got to be different guys who were doing wrong. They've been captured. They've been converted. They're wearing chains as a sign of their penance. As Marley says, the chains they forged in life. And uh, now they have to go out and they have to do service to humanity. And, and that's, I mean, that's what it's got 
to be about. St. Nicholas is about not punishing these guys. He doesn't set them on fire. He doesn't send them off to hell. He drafts them into service to do good. And that's what mm. St. Nicholas is about. That's what Santa is about. That's what Christmas has got to be about. Second chances, a chance to right old wrongs. It's a new year. It's a new time. The light is coming back. Do better. Right? And that's what it's got to be. That's what Krampus has to be. That's my take on it. Yeah, that would be very awesome, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I didn't want to make this podcast just, although I would also love to do that, and that would entertain at least me. Uh, I'll have a little digression. Starting from, um, oh, Advent until Candlemas, I just follow my wife around the house, spewing out interesting facts about Christmas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she... She gets, she gets a little annoyed about, about about by the fifth week. So I just didn't want to turn this into us asking you interesting uh, Christmas stories from around the world. But caveat, Benito Iceland. Like, like yeah. WTF Iceland. Like, would, would, could you talk a little bit about some of the dark figures, plural, the many of sure. them that, that haunt that place at Christmas? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Iceland is particularly dark. Metaphorically, because it's particularly dark, literally. So if, as mm-hmm. taking that as the premise that I set up earlier, that you know we have dark stories at this time, uh, because it's it's physically dark. I mean, Iceland is dark longer and more than a lot of places. And so, but also, um, that's they're a place that take their lore very seriously. Even in a modern context, you can see stories about in Iceland where construction projects, building roads, and things like that are set off or are moved or postponed because people are legitimately concerned about the presence of elves uh, in particular areas, and they don't want to um, they don't want to upset them. And so, um, yeah, Iceland is a kind of place where those kind of stories are very prominent. And so, yeah, you've got um, very old stories that are still modern that to today have been somewhat um, influenced by um, mainstream American. Santa Claus, which is true of just about everywhere. I mean, lots of places have their own um, their own particular gift giver that a lot of them are a lot more Santa-like. You know, in Finland, the Yule goat that I was talking about used to be uh, a scary goat person who demanded presents. Now, now in Finland, Yulupuki, the Yule Yule goat, is just Santa Claus. Right? He's uh, he's got a goat-like beard, but otherwise, he's just Santa Claus. Um, and so, uh, for example, the, the, the gift givers in uh, Iceland didn't even used to be gift givers. They are uh, the 12 brothers, the U.S., uh, who's, uh, who have a number of names like, uh, let's see if I can remember them. Uh, I don't, I definitely don't remember them in, in Icelandic. Um, but uh, you have guys like uh, Sausage Stealer, uh, uh, stubby sheep coat clod and so on and these are 12 different guys who basically uh, go around trying to ruin your Christmas originally at least right they would um, they would sneak into your sheep pens and suck the teats of your sheep until they were dry and could not get milk anymore uh, or they would swipe your sausages from the rafters while they were smoking uh, or they would eat all of your leaf bread or they would eat all of your steer which is uh, yogurt uh, things that are particularly popular at Christmas time, or the guy that comes last uh, would eat your candles, um, which would have been a rare treat uh, for, um, for Icelandic children in the old days. Um, candles being made of tallow, uh, they would have been edible, I guess. But um, uh, so, but these guys now are much more. Uh, now they're gift givers. They come. Uh, they, they each, it's still the idea is one comes. Uh, a day, 12 days before Christmas, and then they leave uh, one by one in the 12 days of Christmas. But now they bring gifts. They'll leave you a small gift on your shoe or on the mantle or uh, on your window pane or whatever. Um, and usually on Christmas Day, you'll see them when they're all there, and they'll actually be wearing very similar red and white, similar uh, to Santa, Santa suits, and um, they have beards, and they look just like, they look like 12 Santa Clauses, basically. Um, now they'll come to, uh, the, they go to like the National Museum uh, in, I don't know, probably Reykjavik, I don't, I don't remember, but um, they go there and they'll, uh, the children will see them there and they'll go around and like one of the brothers, Spoon Licker, will act weird if he sees a spoon and so on, right? Um, but uh, yeah, they used to be 
uh, more sinister as used to be true of a lot of these figures. Um, they are the they are the children of the still sinister uh, Grilla, who is an ogress, uh, who eats children, uh, and, <laughs> and throughout the year she stays up in her cave and uh, she listens for misbehaving children and uh, she will eat them. She has uh, x number of tails and on each tail is a bag and in each bag can hold 20 children or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, she, and she's uh, ogress or a troll or whatever, and uh, they live out in these lava fields, uh, which are out there, which are yeah believed to have trolls and ghosts and such in them. Um, Rila is so evil that she's she's now on her third husband, having eaten the previous two for being too lazy uh, or what, uh, various other reasons. <laughs> um, and uh, famously, uh, her pet cat, the Yule cat who is an enormous black cat that uh, if you do not receive uh, new clothes in time for Christmas, uh, will eat you. Um, which definitely is one of those um, kind of, you know, didactic stories where the idea is, uh, you know, you need new clothes because it's really cold, and if you don't have new clothes, bad things will happen to you. So, you know, you tell children. You, rather than saying, you'll die of hypothermia, instead you say, a giant cat will eat you, and... That's your for a job to grasp, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when I was a kid, I had, my grandmother always got me pajamas, and I was always a little disappointed because I wanted a He-Man or something. But if she had told me that if she did not give me pajamas, a demon cat would murder me, I would have liked him a lot more. <laughs> yeah. I I never knew how grateful I should have been to my grandma for all those <laughs> all those disappointing boxes full of khakis over there. <laughs> So we touched on this uh, a little bit before, but the um, like basically my thesis is is that uh, even for 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 ninety nine point nine percent of people and people who don't even like Christmas, it's just it's it's almost an oppressively happy time of the year. So we're blowing some minds for letting them know about it's it's, it's sort of shadow. But but what what kind of ruins my thesis is the most famous. Christmas story of them all, besides the nativity, would would be Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and it's it's an effing ghost story. Um, is this is this something he just made up? Did he just decide that a, a great way to celebrate a holly jolly Christmas would be to write a ghost story, or is he tapping into some sort of contemporary tradition, or is he aware of this darker side of Christmas? Is it all coming from his creativity? Um, so yeah, so if you could talk about that. Oh sure. Um, no, he's uh, for sure following that. Um, tradition that already exists of a darker side of Christmas. And um, Christmas and ghost stories, you know, like the song says, those actually go back a ways. And in fact, you know, in the UK, still on the BBC, they always have a ghost story for Christmas and they show a scary movie. And some of the, some, you know, really classic um, ghost stories, Mr. James and things have been adapted as specifically as Christmas specials uh, in, the, in the UK. Um, but uh, yeah, Dickens, in fact, wrote a number of, um, ghost stories or similar um, for Christmas, not just Christmas Carol, of course, is the most famous one. Um, he wrote uh, The Bells, which is about goblins. There's one about another one about goblins who kidnap a sexton uh, at Christmas. Um, several others that have supernatural themes in it. Um, and he's not the only one. Uh, um, at that time, uh, there were very popular uh, literary uh, collections that would come out. Um, at Christmas time, Poe, a lot of his stories debuted at Christmas, um, and they would have books with titles, something you know, like A Ghost Story for Christmas or something along those lines. Um, and so, uh, no, Dickens for sure wasn't uh, creating that, but he is responsible for a lot of the popularity of Christmas, to be honest, because uh, you know, prior to Dickens, Christmas was not incredibly popular um, in England. It was not popular in the U.S. It was not something celebrated, you know, the founding fathers of the U.S. would not have celebrated Christmas so much. Those from the English tradition who come down from Puritans, mm -hmm. who went back, uh, uh, they they outlawed Christmas in, those, in, uh, in the 1600s. So many of the Puritans uh, who came over to the U.S. would not have celebrated Christmas at all, or really any holiday. But um, but certainly in England as well, in the, during the, uh, the time of the the, the Regency period, uh, Cromwell and his ilk would have uh, outlawed. Um, Christmas, and so its uh, celebration was not uh, quite as boisterous as we think of it now, and it, it had a lot to do with first uh, in the U.S. It had to do with uh, 
German immigrants, um, but uh, in England, a lot of it had to do with uh, Dickens, who said, you know, we need something, we're forgetting Christmas, and we need to bring it back, and so he popularizes, uh, he, bring, he kind of is the guy who brings Christmas back, and we say Merry Christmas, because that's what Dickens said. Ah. So, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, he, he does start a lot of things, but he does not start the tradition of associating Christmas with ghosts. Um, so, uh, the, it's popular, there's kind of popular memes that float around this time of the year that everything that's sort of fun and interesting as well as some of this dark stuff that, that we see in Christmas are all pagan holdovers. Uh, I think of the Christmas tree and I gotta say, there is something pagan about cutting down a tree, bringing it into my house and decorating it <laughs> and then worshipping it with presents. But, uh, so, but like as a classicist, like you already mentioned Saturnalia a few times. Like, do, do you see a lot of Saturnalia left in Christmas? Or did we uh, when, when Christianity happened? Did it just take that stuff over? Does, does all that duality just come from the pagan side, or is there some sort of like some kind of mix? Is there still like a, sort of a dark side even in the Christian imagination, and is there sort of Christian elements to some of these um, some of these uh, traditions that may seem dark or strange or you know aren't uh, aren't just nativity uh, traditions. Uh, well, the, uh, it's it, it it is a it is a mix. Um, uh, there is some uh, some Saturnalia. Obviously, you know, there's no no evidence, and in fact, evidence to the contrary that uh, that the birth of Jesus happened, you know, in December. In fact, it probably was in the spring. Um, but uh, yeah, so you you set the celebration there. Uh, because Saturnalia, you know, during uh, the, you know, 4th uh, century AD, um, during the Roman Empire, when Christianity starts to become uh, a major thing there, uh, yeah, you do see it move there to, to um, adopt some of the traditions. Um, and, and uh, you know, the Romans were always good at uh, syncretism, right? That was one of the main things that caused the success of um of the Romans and before them the Hellenists and the fact that they were able to take native um, traditions and incorporate them into their own beliefs and make something that appealed to both sides. And so it's not really surprising to me that Christmas could be syncretized in that way um, because you can look at something like in Saturnalia where the tradition of, uh, of giving gifts um, at, uh, can be, then you say, well, Jesus received, received gifts from the Magi, and so it, that's a connection there, and so now we do that. Um, Martin Luther did a lot of that during the Protestant Reformation, um, so a lot of the things that we have now, um, the Christmas tree in particular, um, were popularized by Martin Luther. He takes, he takes that as a symbol because, uh, uh, and it's a symbol specifically of Protestant Christmas because prior to that, you mm. have uh, the Nativity, the creche, um, which uh, created by uh, Thomas Quine, um, and he saw these as idolatrous, and ironically, I guess, uh, but he saw them as idolatrous, and so he wanted an alternative um, to these statues of Jesus and Mary. And so he adopts the figure of the Christmas tree, which he likes uh, for two main reasons. One, uh, the triangular shape of it uh, points toward heaven and also uh, reminds us of the Trinity. And so um, for that reason, he adopts that. Uh, he also would adopt uh, wreath. Um, and again, ev evergreen material works well for the Christian message of eternal life um, and resurrection and that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, a lot of it is a lot of it is definitely um, borrowed from more pagan traditions. A lot of stuff from Yule and Germanic traditions get added in. A lot, a lot of the things that we think of as really traditional Christmas come from uh, Martin Luther trying to create a new uh, separate track that is less uh, less Catholic and more Protestant, but is then ironically more Germanic and pagan, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is definitely ironic. Oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, um, I'm from a small town, and uh, when I go back home and visit uh, for Christmas, there's always letters to the editor uh, every year. I don't know why they publish them, but from perhaps people who are more on the fundamentalist or evangelical uh, Christian side, just talking about how how Christmas trees are, are, are straight uh, pagan uh, uh, devilry. <laughs> and uh, um, so I, I didn't realize that uh, that they had originally been uh, uh, pumped up as a substitution for uh, 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 idol worship of the nativity scene. So I'll, I'll write a counter letter to the editor. <laughs> because that always accomplishes that, so much. That, oh, that always yeah. does so much. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it looks like we're up against our time here, uh, but uh, fascinating conversation. I, I really, um, well, I learned a lot, quite frankly, and, and um, I want to go live in Iceland now. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> But I will anyway. say just one, one real quick one. The mm -hmm. weirdest one, not so dark, but to me, in my opinion, the weirdest Christmas gift giver is in uh, it's in Spain, one of their autonomous communities. I don't remember which one it is. Maybe English, maybe Asturias. I don't remember. Uh, their gift giver is a guy named Apalpador, and what he does is he uh, that his name it means uh, like the patter. It's related to uh, palpate, right? And so he will sneak into your house and he'll pat the children's bellies while they're sleeping and to hear if they're full or hot, empty and if the children's bellies are empty he will leave them a big pile of hazelnuts and that's uh he's a, he's a weird one not a dark one but a weird one well he could be depending on yeah. <laughs> and you find that you find that weirder than a pooping log uh benito uh i'm i'm really used to the pooping log You're, you're used to the pooping i log. actually yeah. had a friend, a friend of mine went to um went to Catalonia and he brought me back uh, I, uh, a, a cagonier that is, is cagatillo. So it's two in one. So it's your little pooping guy, but he is the pooping log at the same time. He poops out a little present on the figure. It's pretty great. I got it under my uh, got it under my little Christmas tree that I have up on the mantle. <laughs> yeah, very strange. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, uh, thank you so much, Benito, for, uh, for joining us and for your interesting stories and... Uh, we're so glad to have you, and, and I'm sure we'll we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Yeah, awesome. A lot of fun, guys. Thanks. All right. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.